So good to have you with us on our behind the scenes podcast uh, here together. Uh, Pastor Levi and Pastor Connie are with us today and uh, Pastor Tim and Pastor Eddie are away. And so we are just excited to be with you today and looking forward to a good time uh, in the word. Uh, Today we're continuing on in our series in Mark and today we are in Mark chapter nine. And so we're going to have a good time uh, here today just talking about the word. And so, uh, Pastor Levi, would you read for us uh, Mark 9, verses 2 through 13? And before you do that, Connie, would you pray for us? Yeah, absolutely. All right, Lord, thank you for another opportunity to uh, be with one another, to sit and look into your word, and also for another opportunity where um, we lean into you in order to help set the table on a Sunday. So, Lord... Uh, guide our conversation, speak into us, and then for listeners, Lord, we pray that something would be able to resonate where they are able to understand more of who you are and draw closer in relationship to you. So we lift this time to you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Mark 9, 2 through 13. I'm reading out of the NLT version today. Six days later, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them up a high mountain to be alone. As the men watched, Jesus' appearance was transformed, and his clothes became dazzling white, far whiter than any earthly bleach could ever make them. Then Elijah and Moses appeared and began talking with Jesus. Peter exclaimed, Rabbi, it is wonderful for us to be here. Let us make three shelters as memorials, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He said this because he didn't really know what else to say, for they were all terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them. A voice from the cloud said, This is my dearly loved son. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, Moses and Elijah were gone, and they saw only Jesus with them. As they went back down the mountain, he told them not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept it to themselves, but they often asked each other what he meant by rising from the dead. Then they asked him, why do the teachers of religious law insist that Elijah must return before the Messiah comes? Jesus responded, Elijah is indeed coming first to get everything ready. Yet why do the scriptures say that the son of man must suffer greatly and be treated with utter content, contempt? I tell you, Elijah has already come, and they chose to abuse him, just as the scriptures predicted. Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So what we see here is what was we often call or refer to as the transfiguration. I think um, Levi's version said it a little differently. He used the word transformation, I believe. Um, NIV version I'm looking at says transfiguration, mm-hmm. um, which is an important um event in in Jesus ministry here on earth. And so we just want to open it up and what kind of jumped out to you guys? What what uh, resonated with you in that that passage? Well, first thing that jumped out at me was the description of a high mountain. Like, I think there's some interesting things that happen on mountains. Mm. All of a sudden, the picture that came into my mind harkened back to uh, like Moses going up the mountain mm-hmm. when he, after they led the Israelites out of Egypt, out of slavery, and he goes up the high mountain and no one can see him. And here these guys are going up the high mountain with Jesus and they're all alone. <laughs> there's no one around. <laughs> so that, that, I don't know if I've ever soaked into that part before, but that jumped out at me as we began the, began reading the passage. Yeah, that important things seem to happen in scripture, at least on mountaintops. And certainly something important happened here in this yeah. case. I love this passage as the, um, like, uh, coming back from, like, a camp uh, or an NYC or a, because it reminds us, um, at least to me, that passage where, where Peter, not knowing kind of what he's supposed to say, is like, let's just, let, like, let's stay up here. Like, let's have these shelters that we can build and, mm-hmm. and we can just stay up here with, Elijah and Moses and, you know, have a good time. And ultimately what they wind up doing is coming back down Mm -hmm. from the mountain and going kind of back to, you know, what you might call like mundane everyday life in a sense um, that you can't, 
there's moments like in our faith where we have these spiritual mountaintops and stuff, but we can't expect that necessarily every single day. I mean, some probably more than others, probably some maybe yeah. feel like not so frequently and stuff, but uh, it's natural for <laughs> even Jesus and Peter and these guys to have mm -hmm. kind of these, these huge, massive God moments, these crazy experiences and uh, where they're super close and connected with God. And, but then the last they come down the mountain too and go back into everyday life, hopefully being transformed in mm -hmm. a different way though, too, where they mm -hmm. then mm -hmm. live differently. I mean, that's the whole Christian message kind of is to be transformed and to um, live differently in a sense. Yeah. And it does, it does capture a, a moment. It's not an always. Yeah. Um, Cause I, trying to remember if we talked about it among us at one point but uh, the time though between when Jesus's baptism where he hears the voice of the father this is my son and then really the only other time that we have where it's recorded that Jesus and the voice of the father happen is now here on top of the mountain at the transfiguration so even Jesus we know from especially the other parts of Mark where we see him getting away to quiet, mm -hmm. getting away to pray. Uh, so he has that regular routine and commitment, but his mountaintops also only come sometimes. Yeah. Um, and I think he's intentional here in bringing Peter, James, and John. Yeah. I don't think it's a surprise to Jesus what's going to happen here. Um, and he wants there to be eyewitnesses. And, you know, as we know, Mark, the writer here of this gospel, um, he wasn't there. Right. But he spent a lot of time with Peter, and I suspect, Scripture doesn't tell us, but I suspect that's where he learned about this is probably from Peter. And I, you know, I chuckle a little bit in verse 6, uh, where Mark kind of adds a little bit of commentary here. Uh -huh. He you know, says, he did not know what to say, talking mm -hmm. about Peter, right? They were so frightened. Um, you know, sometimes I wonder what that conversation was like between Mark and Peter, you know, that yeah. maybe there's a little bit of ribbing there going on, but yeah. you know, it, it's <laughs> kind of fun to think about that. But I don't, I don't think Peter was and James and John were necessarily afraid in terms of I'm running away in fear. This is more of an in awe kind yeah. of fear of what's, what's happening before me. I can't believe my eyes, you know, this is, this is not natural. This is supernatural. You know, something yeah. supernatural is, is happening and we're witnessing it with our own eyes. Yeah. This, this description and account and then the ascension is the other one that um, if I've ever brought it up with the kids, if we ever have reason to study it together, I, I try to remind them like they have, they don't have movies. Like they don't see yeah. weird, crazy things before <laughs> their eyes. Right. So like to watch a guy just standing there and then all of a sudden there's clouds and fog and he's totally different. Mm -hmm. like, like maybe a stage plays, but even that mm -hmm. is not, as visual as what we right. do with our special effects. Right. <laughs> and then the same kind of thing with the Ascension, like this man just literally floating up into the sky. Yeah. This is something that is mind blowing and not something that they would have ever really even captured in their imagination, mm -hmm. uh, which we kind of do every day with the things that we see mm -hmm. on <laughs> screens. Yeah. Cause we can just say, I mean, that's, I know for me, it's always, like, you know, okay, is this faked or something? You know, you can, yeah. you can see YouTube YouTube videos and different things. And the first thing I go is, okay, well, what did they do? Like, you know, what, what editing trick did they, right. what did, like, there's there's no way that that actually happened or mm -hmm. something. Or right. just a trick. And there's so many hoaxes and stuff that that's kind of what you have to do almost right. or else you'll kind of yeah. just be gullible. But yeah, this is before, before video editing or uh -huh. uh, was a thing. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Yeah, and before you could just get swept up in those stories and not really think critically about them, you know, we watch superhero mm -hmm. movies all the time. But if you stop and actually think about what they're portraying in the story, it's this would be catastrophic. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so here these guys watch him get transformed, and this is like it it's mind blowing. Yeah. <laughs> And I think you're right. It comes back to Moses too, where he's got this, this radiance yeah. or something that same as Mount, he goes up to the mountaintop, you know, and he's you know, I don't know when he comes down, if Jesus is still 
glowing in a sense or this this whiteness that is just radiating basically yeah. from him. that's exactly what uh, moses experienced too was this came down the mountain like looks like a ghost of right. some sort <laughs> right he's just got this this transformation this physical sort of transformation of being with god and it's like seeing and hearing from god yeah yeah and there are there are there are strong callbacks to the old testament aren't there inside of this which that's interesting because we've talked about how Mark would have most likely been written to Gentile mm-hmm. readers, but he has some strong callbacks yeah. to Old Testament stories. And I mean, even the fact that the, the people that are in this, you know, in this setting or whatever is you, I mean, you have Elijah, you have Moses and Jesus and they're what seems like all on equal playing field yeah, sort of thing that this isn't, you know, uh, some sort of angelic um, sort of talking down to right, sort of right, thing. Okay. It's like he, Jesus is being elevated to the same status as, I mean, I don't think these guys just showed up for right. <laughs> your everyday uh, pastor or synagogue leader <laughs> or something. This is. And, yeah, you know, maybe wild. that's, that's what Peter, James and John are thinking, you know, they see the big three, right? Yeah. You see Jesus <laughs> yeah. and Moses and um, Elijah until God speaks, yeah. right? Then he kind of separates him a little bit, doesn't he? Yeah. Yeah. Remember, he says, this, you know, this cloud appeared, enveloped them, and the voice of God came from the cloud. This is my son whom I love. Listen yeah, to really. him. Mm. Right? Not to Moses, not to Elijah. Yeah. Listen to him. Wow. Right? He calls him that out. That's a good connection. Yeah. That's a good connection. That this is what, I mean, talk about a practical, <laughs> you know, practical sort of thing. Um, called action or whatever. The, mm-hmm. I mean, literally, we get God's word from, we get God's word that tells us that God's words were to listen to my son. Right. <laughs> you know? and so Jesus, he he chooses to include his inner circle, right, mm-hmm. in this experience. Um, and other than the obvious that he wants an eyewitness there, you know, he wants the story to be told, Right. Other than that, why do you think he invited them? Why do you think they're a part of this? What, what's the significance of them being there? That's a good question. Well, we know they're his, his, his favorites. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I guess he's the, because these are the same, this is the same group that gets brought into the um, girl who is dead dash asleep right. uh, mm-hmm. and gets uh, raised from the dead as well that Jesus heals. And um, I think he takes them too to the garden of just enemy too, where he kind of brings them closer. Yeah. They go a little further with him. They go a little further with him. This is kind of the, the main people that, you know, Jesus um, is teaching and discipling. Mm -hmm. And I guess I have different thoughts floating around because I don't know if I've ever outside of the eyewitness has kind of contemplated it, but not, as strongly but in the context of the bigger picture of jesus with the disciples Mm -hmm. like i think some of this is is freeing in my humanity to recognize like jesus had guys he connected with different than the others and so when something deep was going on those those are his go-tos not because he didn't like have other people around who he loved and appreciated but he connected different with Mm -hmm. them and i say freeing in my humanity because sometimes I connect different with some people sure, and yeah. sometimes I can give myself a lot of guilt over thinking, Oh, I really should be connecting with this kid in the ministry. And I'm really not, they're kind of hard for me. And well, you know, I don't stop that. The challenge then is to like be okay with what that relationship is. Mm-hmm. Uh, That's I think a big it speaks into a big part of, you know, for, for the call for other people to Mm -hmm. come alongside and help out because you know this is i mean one of the things that i was always told is yeah that like you know jesus had 12 people in his group in his circle in his you know church or whatever if you Mm -hmm. want to call it that he really connected with and was able to really kind of disciple three of them in a sense these three Mm -hmm. and then so our kind of goal as a church is to create this this sort of web of you know that if we had you know, speaking in youth group terms or something, if we had 
you know, five parents or something or five leaders in the church that all took like kind of connected with and Mm -hmm. developed a relationship with three students. I can only maybe connect with three, maybe five or something. But if we get like five other uh, leaders um, or adults, people in the church to just kind of meet up with these students, check in with them, pray for them, um, kind of mentor them in a sense, then you have all five of them have their own three and pretty soon your entire youth group or church to influence area of influence is completely covered yeah in a sense and so that i mean that's just like such the crucial role of having these volunteers having these leaders having other people step up um and willing to just meet with students and stuff because i know like for me i really struggle to connect with uh the girls in our youth group (laughs) in a sense it's just such a different and you know for other reasons as well that um kind of risk stuff um, yeah. it's it's just i i just don't connect with them on the same level that a few other people do and yeah there's kind of some guilt in that that like oh man i just i don't have that but it's like yeah. but if we can get other people you know get some um ladies of the faith and stuff mm-hmm. to speak into their lives then it's like then that relationship is what's going to help them mm-hmm. um yeah, you see the concept of multiplication, right? Mm-hmm. Where yeah, that that leadership um, is expanded to other leaders, and they create more leaders, and and pretty soon you're able to reach many more. You I mean, see that in the life of Jesus and the way he went about his ministry. See that in the life of this book too. I yeah. mean, the <laughs> fact that Peter told Mark, Mark wrote this letter to yep. the yep. Gentiles. The Gentiles heard yep. about it, and then yeah, spoke yep. about it to other people and stuff, and helped them kind of go through it and walk mm-hmm. through it with them. And it's like soon yeah you got this insane (laughs) and that was paul's whole model too you know Mm -hmm. sure he traveled around and planted the churches but he didn't keep going right he he corresponded right he helped train and correct and all of those important things that we do you know as we're uh developing leaders but yeah he had those key people yep in in each each, one each city that yep yeah Well, talking about uh, Moses and Elijah, and we, we're going to focus in on them a little bit more on Sunday. Um, and the idea of these important Jewish men, right? These, these, you know, fathers of the faith in a lot of ways, mm-hmm. you know, and how Jesus is kind of exalted mm-hmm. above them by God himself, right? Um, calling him out and saying, this is my son, right? Follow him, do what he says. Um, it kind of sets the stage for this new that Jesus is bringing. And we're, we've talked about that. We're going to talk about that on Sunday. Um, some, and I think this is a combination of the things we've been talking about. Not only is God making it clear that something new is coming, right? He's not discounting the old. He's not saying the old is bad or anything like that, but he's saying it's a new season of life, right? We're ready to start something new with my son, with Jesus. Um, and he's going to introduce to us this new covenant. And this new covenant is going to be new. It's going to be different, but it's going to be amazing. Um, and then we, we see this idea of multiplication as this new covenant is realized, as it's mm-hmm. communicated. Um, one of the things I was listening to a podcast uh, the other day, and I think it was Tom Rainer, and, and he spoke about how the timing was perfect in history, not just in the Jewish culture, yeah. but in history. So had the Romans not developed all those roads mm-hmm. into to a point where they could be traveled like never before, um, the gospel wouldn't have spread like it did. Right. And so we see this entire picture of God at work. Um, we see it all through the book of Mark, but we see, again, a little snapshot of it here in this transfiguration experience as God is beginning something new. Come back to that question, too. Of that. Mark is asking over and over and over again throughout the entire book is, okay, who is... Who is this Jesus? Yeah. Whatever in this. Yes. Apparently, yeah, he's someone that is of the same and if not higher, you know, status yes. of the Elijah, the Moses. I mean, that crazy. If there are doubts before, that, yeah, God really kind of makes it clear. <laughs> exactly. As clear as it probably can be that who is this Jesus? <laughs> right. So here, here's this went through my mind, though. 
kind of the, the with the clarity and yet still the mystery because mm -hmm. he makes it really clear but <laughs> but don't tell by the, right don't tell anyone, <laughs> don't tell anyone. Until <laughs> so yeah. but by the testimony of these three guys because yeah. he doesn't like do this not like the baptism where everybody who's standing around right. at the baptism hears this yeah. this is uh maybe even at this point maybe a little bit for jesus because the what we have in mark what happened six days earlier is when he started really saying no look i'm going to be betrayed i mm -hmm. will be killed mm -hmm. whoo that's heavy this is my son don't forget who you are mm -hmm. <laughs> but then that testimony so we have it really clear and yet it's by testimony of just those three guys mm -hmm. after the fact so there's still there's clarity yet mystery in our faith and we're back to the tension we talked about before yeah. and as we see in their lives as you know these guys peter james and john and the other disciples as they went through the time of jesus being arrested oh. and being crucified i mean they abandoned him like yeah. that you know so yeah. as clear as this was or should have been there's still that human element that doubted that thought you know it's not really what we thought it was yeah hindsight is a lot yep yep, <laughs> yep. Of course, after he was resurrected, they go, ah, oh, the pieces started coming exactly. together. That's what he means by okay. raised uh -huh. from the dead. I, I like literally raised from the dead. I didn't uh, know you meant you were going to really do this. Yeah. Just to be fair, there's not really a good track record with people coming back from the dead. No, you know, no. The probability isn't all that high. No, there's no reason. Again, it's right. like the transfiguration and then the ascension in and of itself. There's no imagination yeah, for there's it. There's nothing. Right. Yeah, there's no... There's yeah, no exactly. context by which to think, oh, right. yeah, I could see that happening. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, good. Well, we hope you've enjoyed your time with us uh, today uh, in Mark chapter 9. And um, we just pray a blessing on you this week mm -hmm. and continue to dig in the word with us. And we'll be back right here next week uh, to do it again. God bless you. Have a wonderful week.